The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access for Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at 260-421-1250. Hello, this is Patty Hunter of Patty's Page. Welcome to my show. Today's guest, my special guest on Zoom, is Lydia Fats. Hello, Lydia. Welcome. Hi, Patty. Hi, thank you for having me. Now, you are a person of many talents. Yes. Um, as a famous um, former radio host used to say, talent on loan from God. You might say. Indeed. indeed. <laughs> so, um, Lydia, where were you born and raised? Um, I was born in Washington, D.C. My father was a research veterinarian, and so he was working for the FDA at the time. But then we moved to the Midwest um, shortly after my birth. And he was um, a clinical veterinarian for a couple years. And then he started working in pharmacology and toxicology research. So that's when we moved to Indian, uh, Indianapolis. So I grew up here. In it, well, I grew up in Indy. And then I moved up to Fort Wayne to marry my wonderful husband. <laughs> yeah. How long have you been married? Um, 19 years this year you had to think about that one eh? i did i did because i think it's 19 years yeah okay cool. <laughs> <laughs> we have been bob and i have been married 30 years this come this april 27 oh how wonderful it's a so, good thing huh it's a good it's thing a, it's a good thing yeah ah uh, when you were young who influenced you the most um, I, I honestly don't know. Um, I think as children, um, whatever parent or sibling we're closest to probably has the most influence on us. Um, so my mom was a homemaker and so I was blessed to not be a latchkey kid. I was blessed to have my mom there for us. Um, during the days and when we came home from, home from school and um, and I always looked up to my big sister I kind of idolized her you and got I got a sister oh. yeah I have an older sister and I always just wanted to do whatever it was that she was doing so sense. yeah I have a twin sister and a younger sister by 13 years 13 months not years <laughs> oh, <I have> to <laughs> <laughs> So uh, you went to school. How many schools have you gone to? Uh... Um, as far as my university mm -hmm. education, I went to Ball State in Muncie for my undergraduate degree. And um, I was there for five years. Mm. I started out with a pre-med major because growing up, I loved looking at my dad's um, veterinary journals and his illustrated medical dictionaries. And I wanted to draw those pictures. So I started with a pre-med major and a drawing major. Mm. Um, but then my junior year at Ball State, I took an elective class in metal smithing and it was like an epiphany for me. And, and I was obsessed and I just had to do it. So I dropped the pre-med major, which was really, very difficult anyways. Yeah. Um, um, I couldn't retain all the information mm -hmm. and I think in pictures. I don't really think in words and um, yeah. I think in pictures. 
So for me, the metal smithing um, just came so very naturally for me. And, and likewise with um, the class schedule, you know, if you're in studio classes, which you need to spend a minimum of two hours outside of class for every hour that you're in class and then lab classes for pre-med are Mm. incredibly time consuming and there literally were not enough hours in my day to do both so I ended up dropping the pre-med major and I picked up metalsmithing along with the drawing major so I did five years at Ball State came out with the the drawing and the metalsmithing and then I went to Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York Ooh. for my master's degree in metalsmithing. And I minored in woodworking furniture design. Woodworking, metal, crafting. Oh, my goodness. What else yeah. have you done? Um, well, I used to love watercolor painting. Mm. And I taught myself how to watercolor paint with just those little hard, you know, those little watercolor sets you get when your kids, the little hard palettes. Yeah. I, um, I, I got Ranger Rick magazine when I was a kid and I would reproduce. So I think I started painting maybe junior high or as soon as I was in high school, probably junior high, I started painting with watercolors and I just started doing it. So I'm a, a lot of things that I do are self-taught endeavors um I do like to seek out once I've um decided to go into a medium I do like to seek out um independent instruction because there's nothing like learning from another person you know you can look up stuff on YouTube but it's just not the same as being there with somebody hands-on yes yes yeah. Did you have a collaborator with you uh, during most of your creating with metal and that, or do you just do it by yourself? Or? Just by myself. I don't work with anybody else. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have done a couple of collaborative pieces with um, Patricia Nelson, who was my metals instructor at Ball State. Um, and that's, been a real pleasure and honor to work with her um it's difficult sometimes to do collaborative work when your your aesthetic and your um, visual vocabulary are very very different it can be um a challenge but a really good challenge to bring those um very diverse um uh, methods and approaches together so you have one thing in mind and you're sticking to it. So you know what you're doing. And yeah. if you had anyone else helping you, they'll kind of do, throw you off a bit, wouldn't it? Yeah. It. So you end up doing a lot of sketching together and um, discussion. When I'm working independently, it just flows naturally. And I'll do, um, and I know we'll get into some images later. I'll just do a really rough sketch. Mm-hmm. and the piece just evolves. I don't even stick to my drawing um, in, uh, in, in specific ways, you know, like in details. It just continues to grow and change. So when you collaborate with somebody, um, there's not as much independent leeway to let something go in a different direction and to evolve so what is your mission in life? Um, to, glor- to glorify God with my, my artwork. Yeah. Um, it, my artwork is my calling. And I am the most fulfilled and joyful when I'm creating. And I believe um, as an imager of Christ, um, I'm obligated to do everything to the best of my ability and to do it with excellence. And so I really want my work to be the absolute best it can be. I want it to be the best quality that I can produce. And I want to set a standard 
Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't put a little Jesus label on my work or anything. I think that's, um, almost blasphemous to use, um, our creator as some sort of qualifier for our work. Mm -hmm. So I don't call myself a Christian artist. artist. I'm an artist. Yeah. And I want my work to be the best it can be. And I just want to bring joy to other people's life with the work that I do. So when did you start to make uh, is it necklaces or rings or earrings or what you made? Um, I hadn't made any jewelry until I took that elective class in um, my junior year of um, my time at Ball State. Mm-hmm. I've been drawing since I literally was an infant. As soon as I could hold a pencil, I started drawing. Drawing. So, just whatever. I just started drawing when I was, as soon as I could hold a pencil, when I was, I don't know if I was even a year old, as soon as I could hold a pencil, I started drawing. And my mom said that the things I drew were recognizable as things. They weren't just little scribbles. I was drawing things. Um, So my passion growing up was for drawing and then when I did, figured out how to paint, I loved painting. But then I've always used my paints almost as another drawing medium, using them rather dry to um, draw with. So, um, so when I started university, the medical illustration, which was why I had the pre-med and drawing majors, that seemed like the natural direction to go with my work because I loved drawing yeah. and painting so much. So I hadn't constructed any sort of jewelry until my junior year how long have you been doing that uh, making jewelry so it's been 33 years yeah (laughs) i'm a little older than i look (laughs) nice (laughs) um what was your first piece that you made was it the necklace um actually gosh i'm not sure because When you take um, a a first level class in any medium, you have assigned projects. So I honestly don't remember if the first thing I made was a brooch. I remember one one of the first things I made um, was was a necklace. Um, it was a piercing project, piercing meaning to cut out the center of something. Uh, did you, you never, did you hurt yourself when you were cutting out the metal or? Oh, um, no, 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 once in a while. Well, you use a jeweler saw that uses very, very fine blades. Um, did you have to wear gloves or? No, yeah. you know, once in a while you might cut into your finger, but you end up building up calluses um, and they don't go deep. You put on a Band-Aid and you just move on. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a particularly dangerous craft, but you just use common sense safety measures like wearing safety glasses. If you don't wear spectacles, eyeglasses, when you're working with yeah. um, a power tool or your handsaw, you put on safety glasses. And it's, um, that just becomes part of the habit of being at your bench. So um, what kind of genre of necklaces did you make? Neck pieces, I mean. I love two different um, genres, both neoclassicism and botanicals. And in some ways they relate to each other because I love classical architecture Um, the beauty and perfection of the geometry. Mm -hmm. But then if you look at all of that beautiful classical architecture, the neoclassical Greco-Roman architecture, they're plastered with um, undulations of nature. If you look at, um, you know, like the... um, the frescoes at Herculaneum and Pompeii, all those incredible garden scenes oh, and the gods and goddesses with their diadems and 
Um, so I love, I love both using both imagery. So, so some of my neck pieces are very heavily um, just neoclassical imagery, mm -hmm. um, but then they might be etched or um, watercolor enameled with um, some of the imagery that you would find on the architecture or on the um, terracotta earthenware of the time period. And then other neck pieces that I do are just strictly botanical arrangements. And I use the stones and minerals of my work to... Oh, I'll there's, go ahead. There's one called Byzantine, Byzantine Brass. Yes. The ba uh, Byzantine branch history is... Where would that be from? Um, it's from, I, I used an image of a Byzantine era neck piece mm -hmm. as the composition for my piece. But then I used um, my botanical imagery on the individual plaques of that necklace. And I should have looked up that original neck piece to show you, but it's a really famous neck piece that's in some of the history jewelry books. Um, I think it, golly, I don't remember the date of it's the piece. Beautiful. I saw the picture of it. It's, oh, thank it's you. like a light color with green on it. Green yeah, green. and the original Byzantine piece is gold that has gemstones on each one of the plaques. Mm -hmm. And I think it probably has gemstones that hang down. So I just, I love That's looking at too. historical metal work as well to sometimes create a composition. Um, and then I just use my own imagery within that composition. Yeah, you know, my favorite is cornucopia. I was um, right. just, I had a bunch of loose um, stones. I, I usually buy stones in pairs or in multiples so that I can do earrings. I love making earrings. Oh, I love it. Um, I love earrings. Um, so yeah, so I, I had some singular stones and the arrangement, it, um, is in the shape of a cornucopia, one of those horns. And then this bounty of leaves and stones are coming out of that cornucopia basket. You have, um, so, you have pearls on them? I thought I saw pearls. Yeah, I use a lot of pearls. I use enamel work in most of my things. Mm -hmm. um, I used to go to my alma mater quite often, Ball State, to use their enameling kiln. But um, my professor retired a few years ago, so I haven't been down there since. Mm -hmm. um, so there are some enamels that I haven't made in a long time just because I don't really have access to a kiln, but I, oh. I do a lot of what's called torch firing. I can use what's essentially a plumber's torch and mm -hmm. I, yeah, and I can do torch firing with some larger pieces. Mm -hmm. um, but because the open air with a torch is a very different, environment than an enclosed area with a kiln a kiln is oxygen free oh and the other one takes up oxygen is oxygen rich because you're in the open air so it you affects side right pardon you do your jewelry outside no i have a small space mm -hmm. um with my little bench which is just an old office desk and um my soldering stations in front of a window with a window fan to pull the the fumes out mm -hmm. so so i just turn that fan on so if i'm doing any um, soldering or torch firing the fan just pulls fumes out the window um, yeah. not you <laughs> right right <laughs> not that heavy a fan <laughs> no <laughs> it's a, a very simple basic setup i don't have a how long? How Pardon? long does it take to make that one? Oh, um, neck pieces are anywhere from, 
gosh, like maybe 20 to 50 hours. So most of them would be in the 30 or 40 hour range. It just depends on how much, yeah, how much is involved in it. You know, how, like the Byzantine branch neck piece was That's pretty beautiful. time. That was really time consuming. Mm -hmm. I don't remember how many hours, but it was pretty time consuming. It's beautiful. Thanks. I love it. It's one of my favorite pieces. You're very exquisite, my dear. Thank you. Thank That's you. awesome. So how many uh, have you made neck pieces and jewelry? Have you made oh. over the years? You know? Gosh, I have no idea. Uh, no idea. <laughs> hundreds, hundreds and hundreds. Um, my production level is not high. Mm -hmm. It used to be much higher than it is now. Um, because I used to focus solely on my bench work and I was working with a few galleries. Um, but even then, you know, if you spend 40 hours on a neck piece, um, it'll take me two weeks to make something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, earrings are usually eight to 12 hours. So, so I can get a pair if I really work fo hard, if I'm focused, Mm -hmm. I could do a pair in a day, but usually I'd split it up into two days. Yeah. Um, Get it just right. Yeah. And, and for me, you have to get into, I have to get into like my zone. So when I sit down at my bench, it takes a while to shut out all of the distractions and just to get your mind really disciplined and into what you're doing. And if I've been away from any one of my medium for any amount of time, it's really hard to get back into it. So I've been focused on other things right now. So getting back into my millinery and my yeah, bench good. work, um, it could take me maybe like a week to really get that discipline and, and, um, um, singular focus back. Um, so, so anyways, I used to make a lot more work than I make now. So it's difficult for me to juggle the two different mediums that I'm doing right now. Yeah. Um, and, um, sometimes just the market dictates more of one than the other. Um, so, so you have many hats. Let's talk about another hat. Okay. Hats it is. Yes. We have several hats uh, that you we have you sent us pictures of, you know. And uh, which one of those pictures was your favorite? Oh. Uh, do you remember what you? Yeah, I remember what I sent. Um. I don't know if I could say um, because. Every time I design a new hat, it's like um, kind of like my jewelry. I try to make them each unique and beautiful and diff um, excellent. Mm -hmm. um, I've saved a couple of pieces for myself, like um, the red hat and the yellow hat that um, oh, yes. were, were copies of 1930s pieces. Um, those are mine. I wear them occasionally. Um, Where do you wear them? Huh? Out anywhere and out and about mm -hmm. yes if i go i try to wear a hat every time i leave the house it's just part mm -hmm. of my commitment to excellence mm -hmm. um i dress like a lady when i leave the house i always wear a dress mm -hmm. um i always put on a hat so if i'm going to the post office or walmart or the hardware store i'll put on a skirt and a hat and mm -hmm. um it's just um, my personal convictions about um, um, elevating culture mm -hmm. and um, striving to being the best you can. I think that will catch on again, I hope. Um, Beautiful dress. Oh, thank you. Um, I always get compliments on my hats always and it always makes people smile which is another reason to wear a hat it brings joy to people it makes people smile 
And so many women say, oh, I can't wear a hat. And I say, if you can wear shoes, you can wear a hat. It's just another accessory or garment. You find the shapes and colors that look good on you. And like wearing a brassiere, you, you know, bras are kind of irritating for, you know, the, the part of the audience that doesn't wear them. They're irritating. You're always aware of that thing being there. Yes. But you're used to it. You're used to it. You start, wearing, you start wearing a hat and it feels funny. You might feel conspicuous. But after a while, you're used to it. It's part of you. It's part of you. And when I go out without a hat, I really feel undressed and frumpy. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think those some of those hats, oh my goodness, I could buy all of them off. Yeah. Oh, hats are quite the problem around here. I have here, far but- too many. <laughs> I had so many hats. I had like a purple and red hat. It looks like a red, what do you call it? Woman, uh, red ladies. I don't know. Oh, yeah, the Red Hat Society or whatever. I'm not a member of it, but I do no. something like that. And I have a real beautiful pink one, a big broad one. Nice. Some lace on top of it and little feathers. And I love stuff like that. Good. Good, like, yeah. yeah. But there's only thing with some of these hats that they don't stay on the head. Um, you have to use um, <laughs> you have to use hat pins mm. or um, I wear a lot of 1930s and 40s hats, which is my favorite era, mm. and they use little elastics mm. that go behind the back of your head that yeah. hold them on. You work um, with pardon? You work with fur. At all uh, or have? Um, um, well, the felts that I block are fur felt block, uh, ha- felts. They're made out of rabbit fur. Oh. Um, and it's not like they skin the animal. Um, it's yeah. like the undercoat of the rabbit. You know, and okay. it's, it's felted the same way wool. When you shear a sheep, oh. when you shear a sheep, you don't kill your sheep. Oh, thank goodness. You're, it's like a haircut. They mm-hmm. get they get a haircut, and that wool, when it's processed, is then felted. So a rabbit will get a haircut, and that fur is felted. Where do you get um, your furs? Um, there. Um, the fur felt hoods and cape lines are produced in Czechoslovakia predominantly, um. and then there used to be a millinery supplier up in LaGrange, Indiana, and she just sold her business Mm -hmm. and it moved down to Kentucky. So I'm heartbroken that Mm -hmm. I can no longer go there to take classes and um, pick out supplies, but I can still mail order my supplies from Kentucky. Um, Yeah. Godspeed, my love. In my heart and every dream Don't let this time apart Give in to all our fears God will keep us close from up above So until we meet again Godspeed, my us always for the rest of all our